Please be seated. Make sure cell phones are turned off. So I'm going to be continuing. Thank you. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about Dr. Longo um, and uh, thinking about their testing experts, Dr. Longo and Dr. Compton. Uh, and uh, uh, you folks asked a lot of good questions in this trial, and I want to talk about some of them. But somebody asked, I forget if it was Dr. Longo or Dr. Compton who was up there, somebody asked, basically, don't you have an obligation if you find asbestos or baby powder to report it to the public health authorities? That was a really good question. Um, Your Honor, we have to approach on that. Sidebar. It wasn't asked. What was it? Of, of Dr. Longo. Do you have to report them now to the authorities? We have to make sure. Okay. just one where What's the, reference on? the questions the questions came in on page 295 okay but what did I give the marking to it oh right you of course asked some let me see are you regulated blah, blah, blah. are you regulated um, does your lab come under the same rules as a government lab I'm not sure if it's long or long I, I saw that who it ensures that your optics are calibrated um, what happens if your lab is not compliant? Um, is it, what is the accuracy of calculating for a bottle? Finally, asbestiform versus non-asbestiform. Um, and then you said, what about surface charges? That, that, that question wasn't asked. Yeah, that wasn't answered. Um, Council is stricken from the record. That was not a question that was asked of any expert. 
you heard the plaintiff's experts talk a lot about um, their claim that there's asbestos in talcum powder. And then we asked Dr. Longo, did you ever publish that to the world? Did you ever tell the world that you're finding or your lab's finding asbestos in baby powder? He hasn't. He said, oh, I'm working on it. It's been years. The only place he's given that opinion is in courtrooms for lawsuits for money. If he really found baby powder and asbestos in baby powder, why isn't he publishing that to the world in the peer review literature? Ask yourself why. That would be an important thing for people to know. Why is he only telling that in lawsuits, not to the scientific community in peer review papers? They talked a lot about the company documents and also about Dr. Blount. You remember the Rutgers professor? Uh, and I want to go back to, to Dr. Blount. She was um, a professor of mineralogy and geology here at Rutgers, and she published some papers on talc testing, if you remember. And they showed you um, some of Dr. Blount's um, communications and her studies, and I want to go back to that if I may. And this is uh, Plants Exhibit 2797. It's a letter from April 1998. It's from Dr. Alice Blount to uh, a lawyer for J&J. And she says in her paper here um, that although my papers report an improved method for analysis, the determination for the sample label I, Johnson, Johnson, and Montauk, have been done by the traditional methods as well. See Table 2, 567 in the 1990 paper. And she said she believes Johnson's how it contains trace amounts of asbestos. That's what she said, referring to her 1990 paper. But something doesn't add up about Dr. Blount and her findings, and I want to walk you through that to see if it makes sense to you. Her 1990 paper is this one. We can look at it. Um, it is Defense Exhibit 9955, and and this is, uh, Mr. Nolan's very neat, he doesn't like it when I put papers out, but just hold on, I'll do that. Uh, Defense Exhibit 9995, this is the 1990 paper uh, by Dr. Alice Blount, and she talks about her experimental testing method, right? She says, the major part of our effort has been devoted to experimentation with tau-containing amphiboles, and that's rocks, could be asbestos, but most of the time you heard it's not. This paper will discuss experimentation with talc and amphibole mixtures. And then we go to her table two. And remember in the letter, she tells the J&J lawyer that table two, on page 567, sample I is Johnson and Johnson's Vermont talc, right? But we go to page 567 of her paper, and we go to table two, and we look at sample I, finds nothing. It doesn't add up. And then we go to her sample I, which she says Johnson and Johnson's in her letter. There's no fibers, there's no nothing. And there's no other sample I anywhere in this paper. So that doesn't seem to add up. And then we go to her 1991 paper, which you've seen in this case. This is Planet Exhibit 3390. And this is and again, it's not about asbestos, it's from Dr. Brown, Blount trying to find amphiboles. That's what she's testing for, any kind of rock fragment, trace amounts, amphiboles. Uh, and in her paper, she says, Dr. Blount doesn't agree with the plaintiffs in her published peer-reviewed paper. She says that cleavage fragments that have a 3 to 1 aspect or a greater ratio, there's no good evidence for adverse effects. So. Dr. Blount says just because it's three to one, she agrees with Dr. Weber when he was a public health official, there's no good evidence that those are harmful. And then in her 1991 paper, as we looked at, she talks about her heavy liquid density concentration method, and she says, as we looked at, that it's equally accurate, not that it's more sensitive, that it's equally accurate than traditional methods. And Dr. Blount, the plaintiff's have agreed, she did not use TEM. She did not use the super duper microscope in her testing. She did, She just used the polarized light microscope. She did not use the TEM microscope. And then, if we go here, she says she tested high grade top products from five deposits in Montana, three in Vermont, and one each in North Carolina and Alabama. 
green remote, she says, right? And then in the 1991 paper, she says that she finds in sample I needles and fibers, right? But then in her paper, she calls sample I tremoli. She doesn't say tremoli asbestos, she says tremoli, right? And then, if we go further, she said, the results when compared with the aspect ratios determined for tremoli asbestos with SEM by Campbell show sample I has a distribution similar to asbestos. Similar. Not use a TEM, but similar. And she says tremoli. And then, you saw the key the plaintiffs showed you. J&J produced the key. Got J&J Bates number. And it is produced consecutive Bates, but it doesn't seem to match the paper. Because look, this key says I is the Windsor J&J Tau, JKL, also other Vermont deposits, M is Choi, New York. So that's one, two, three, four Vermont deposits. When Dr. Blount says, in this study, there were three, right? Then they showed you another key. Plaintiff exhibit 3191, which they claim is the Dr. Blount study. But again, it doesn't seem to match up. I is Windsor, but one, two, three, four, five Vermont samples. When she says there were only three. So it doesn't, the keys don't seem to match up with the study in terms of the number of samples. And then something else didn't add up about this paper and her claim that she found trace amounts of asbestos in J&J's talc. She has a graph here about sample I, and she has talc, and she has, and she's comparing it to tremolite asbestos, and she said it has similar aspect ratios. And this is Vermont talc, and you saw there's no dispute that J&J, her paper's 1991, that J&J was using talc from Vermont to, from 64 to 2003, right? She calls it Vermont Windsor talc. But then you heard Dr. Longo, this is Dr. Longo's trial testimony from August 5, 2019. Dr. Longo, their testing expert, said, when you start going from Italian mines to the Vermont mines, the Vermont mines can't have talc, I mean tremolite in it. The Vermont mines can't have tremolite in it. She's saying there's tremolite in the Vermont sample. He's saying the Vermont mines can't have tremolite. He says, you're talking, he says, he's asking about the actual bottles that his lab tested. And he says, correct, as you start hitting into the Vermont years, you change from mostly all tremolite to mostly all anthopolite. That makes the change right there. In other words, there was tremolite in Italy, anthopolite in Vermont. Dr. Longo says you can't have tremolite in Vermont. And Dr. Blanc claims to find tremolite. But then you saw Dr. Longo was shown a page from her deposition where she was asked some questions about this 1991 study by plaintiffs and by defendants. And she was asked, so I, as I understand it, if you have a sample I, and for example, let's say the Johnson & Johnson's product, the next time you don't want that sample I necessarily to be Johnson & Johnson, because then you'll know what the results are before you store. And she says, I don't want to, let me, I, I won't know, even if I put I there, I wouldn't know. I want the letter, I want the letter to be different each time. So I, J&J's I in 1990, According to her testimony, it wouldn't be 91. And then she said, in different orders, so that I don't, I have no idea which which, which one's which when I'm running it, so I'm not biased subconsciously, subconsciously because that happened. So that's why I put these numbers. And then she says, unfortunately, I didn't make a good enough record, and I think some of them got a little mixed up. That's the author of the paper saying, you know what? I think I might have got a little mixed up on samples. And there's no evidence here that Dr. Blount 
permitted anybody else to test what she looked at. No evidence anyone tested Dr. Blount's samples except her. And what we do know is that the samples tested by J&J in the 90s on their line, by TEM, by Polaris, doesn't match up with her claim that there's trace amounts of asbestos. And she says she might have got a little mixed up. And her claim to find tremolite in Vermont is Dr. Longo said there's no tremolite there. So something doesn't add up about uh, Dr. Blount's paper. And then Dr. Blount says this whole thing, because I'm finding, claiming to find trace amounts, is blown out of proportion. It turns out to have blown out of proportion high in Johnson's paper. Something doesn't quite add up to Dr. Blount and her reliance on that paper. In fact, it doesn't say J&J in the published paper anymore. Then they showed you this document. And uh, I submit to you, they showed you a lot of things. So Dr. Longo was asked about um, what he looked at and J&J's documents. And he said, uh, he admitted, of all of the thousands of documents I looked at, there was only about 12 that actually said the words asbestos. The thousands, only 12. And then he admitted, yeah, some of them were samples that J&J intentionally spiked with asbestos as part of their, <coughs> excuse me, as part of their uh, research projects. Some of those related to industrial talc, not cosmetic talc. Some of them related to ore products where we did expo expo exploration that weren't used. Some of them related to mine exploration, not finished product. <coughs> what he didn't show you are documents testing results of Johnson & Johnson's actual product that found asbestos. And we don't have that. You're like, oh, let's, let's find stuff we spiked. Let's find stuff in ore samples we never used. Let's find stuff in some mine, some section of the mine miles away we never used. Where's the testing on the actual samples? And this is an example of that. Instead of talking about product that was actually used, they're talking about ore samples. And they showed you this document and said, oh, look, asbestos, asbestos, right? HC must mean Hammondsville Cosmetic. And you saw that that wasn't necessarily true. And we'll look at that. And two ampables, right? HC, five ampables. Of ore. Well, they're not going to use it if they found asbestos in it. That's the whole point of doing selective mining. You check before you produce the product. And then you saw that HC, they used that, that label for industrial talc, as well as for cosmetic. And here's an example of that, April of 1996, using transmission electronic microscopy combined with selected area and electron refractive. We have been analyzed 21 samples of industrial talc with a general identification of HC. So they used that for industrial talc as well. During the same time frame, this is August of 97 and February of 96, this document is right in that time frame. Another example, we have examined three samples of talc using roofing material. These three talcs are designated HC. So they're using the HC designation for cosmetic talc, but also for industrial talc. And you heard Dr. Hopkins say that most of the talc they sold was industrial talc. Uh, that, that the uh, cosmetic talc was a different process uh, and uh, a whole different testing um, protocol. The, um, another example of uh, what, what we were talking about is this document where they talk about the examination of talc samples in the argonaut, again, in the ore body. Where's the documents on the finished J&J &J baby water? And they, turn, and they like they talk to this, speak to this uh, table two, where McCone says there is like a millionth of a percent of chrysotile in some section of the ore, right? And then you look, and, and also an example of McCone reporting when they're finding way less than five fibers, when they're finding a fraction of a fiber. And then you look at the actual document and it says an intensive examination has been made by x-ray diffraction and TEM of 38 core samples taken from a new ore body which Winters is contemplating exploiting. 
I'm not saying we're using this. I'm like, we're, we're making sure. We're looking around to make sure we use the purest. Or we're not going to use that. We're contemplating exploring. That's why they're sending it out to a crone. If there's any problems, we're not going to use it. And again, not showing you testing on the finished product, but then they like showing you this document. They think they probably showed it a whole bunch of times. It's the research trial, right? This is after the scare. This document is dated in 1974, after the two New York scientists in the, all over the press, and J&J &J saying, you know, if there, if there is an issue, and actually they talk about potential in this document, if there is a potential issue, potentially present, it's all over the press, they're investigating, this is before the FDA put it to bed, that there's no asbestos, they said, well, you know, let's look at all kinds of things we can do if it's there to try to get it out of baby powder, including these reagents, remember these chemical reagents? And so they did research studies, as companies do, and they made clear in these studies they were spiking the samples. I mean, these are the documents they're using to prove asbestos in baby powder. That once were actually J&J is intentionally putting asbestos in to test a reagent, a research protocol. They're saying, we doped it, right? We doped it with 1% of fibrous anthophyllite. We doped it with 2% of fibrous anthophyllite. We're doping the samples. And what they don't, what they didn't show you, but we did, was the testing on the final product that Dartmouth did, right? On page four, it talks about Dartmouth, Dr. R. Reynolds at Dartmouth, looking for amphiboles in, before the study started, in the final product, right? Not in the ore, not miles away in the mine, but in the product. And here's what he said, the detected amphibole minerals did not appear in fibrous form in any, in any of the product samples. That's the Dartmouth report as recounted by J&J. &J. There's no asbestos in the product samples. And then on this table they showed you this chart. They said, oh, well here's part of the document where it doesn't say right on the page that they spiked the samples. Okay, but this is the research project. In the 18th month period where they're spiking the samples as part of this project. And then we showed you related documents where they talk about actually, this is March 74, right in that 18 month period, part of the exploitation reagent study, where they talk about spiking samples with chrysotile. Chrysotile, someone draws a picture of it and they say in an experiment in which asbestos particles were doped into the talc. Another document, samples were doped to test the rejection efficiency of these reagents. And they're talking about chrysotile, doping in chrysotile. And then this document, Defense Exhibit 8263, March 74 again. This is a month before this final report. And look at this. These samples line up. Let's do it. These samples line up perfectly with the ones in the study, right? 66 U war, 66 U product, 66 full. These are the, these are the samples in, the, in this uh, research paper, this plant protocol. And look, J&J &J Windsor Mines is asking Macron to look for chrysotile. It's the only document that says that. Why? Because they're spiking it. Of course they are. It's part of the research. So that's what they're relying on. Testing of ore product never used, Re the documents of research product projects where they're actually spiking the samples with asbestos. And suggesting to you something that the Dartmouth investigator said was not the truth, suggesting that that means there's asbestos in the finished product, Dartmouth says no. In the product samples, no asbestos. And then, they showed you this one from the South, remember the one from the South Plainfield Mill uh, in 84? And this is another company, this is another company's document. This is 1984, Cyprus. And they showed you an inspection report from the Bureau of Mine Safety and Administration, Department of Labor. 
and they, they showed you where they found asbestos fibers in this mill that J&J &J didn't own, and a company that was making talc for a whole lot of other companies, as you heard Dr. Hopkins, making industrial talc, making talc for other folks, and then you saw that the finding related to what was on, on a couple of days, what was in the air, not in the bulk sample. It wasn't in the talc. No evidence it was in the talc. Again, innuendo, allegations, not evidence it was in the finished product that was sold to J&J. &J. Then they claimed, oh, J&J, &J, they're so bad, they were telling customers that they could wash out the asbestos. Remember that? Not the truth. They showed you this, the plaintiff's exhibit 2557. And this is a letter to a customer after all this press about asbestos and baby powder uh, in the early 70s. Somebody wrote saying, is there, you know, basically, is there asbestos? And they talked about all of their procedures. They talked about washing out impurities. But then they say they checked with scientific methods, x-ray, thermal analysis, TEM, to confirm the absence of asbestos. Not that we're washing it out. We're washing impurities, and then we are testing to make sure there's no asbestos. That's what they're telling customers. They like to show these Project 101 documents, uh, and this related to, and then you heard Dr. Hopkins talk about it. This related to, you heard when the mines run out, you know, they, they exhaust, you can't, there's no more uh, clean top to mine. you got to look for other mines. This related to research on other mines mines that they were using. Project 101 is, uh, and, this, and this specifically was looking at a mine in California that they never used. And they talk about um, the reason we have to firm up our position on Tremolite. Now, they told the FDA, we'll look at it, and, everybody, and the FDA knew, and it was openly discussed, that they had trace amounts of Tremolite, the good rock, uh, in their towel. And what the, what, the, what the question here being discussed is, can we go to a mine that has more tremolite? And so that's why they're asking, if you have more tremolite, is that going to be an issue? And that's the question. And they say top exceeding trace contents have never been approved. And they talk about the confusion, that there are different varieties, right? And they're asking the doctor, the question, the question is, how, how, medically, if we use more, is there going to be an issue? What a good company should do about a mine they, haven't, they, didn't, they never used. And then there was a response to the document talking about that, um, that tremolite can have needle crystals that are those are the cleavage fragments we talked about, that they could penetrate the skin and cause irritation. And then they said, to the best of my knowledge, we have no factual information that this has ever happened. And then they talk about the General Johnson, uh, the uh, Johnson & Johnson Air and several pediatric pediatricians expressing concern over the possibility of the adverse effects on the lungs of babies or mothers. And you heard about the incidents where people were, not cancer, but people were choking, right, on too much um, dust inhalation from talcum powder. And they showed you uh, those commercials from, um, you know, some of them looked like they were in the 60s or 70s, uh, where there was uh, dust from the powder. And you know, and, and no evidence the plaintiffs saw any of those. In fact, the judge, I think, instructed the plaintiffs to see any of those, and there was no evidence. And I submit to you, they show those to, to, you know, to try to make the company look bad. But think about the 70s and 60s. We did, all of us did things that you wouldn't do now. Nobody wore seat belts. Kids weren't wearing bike helmets. Some of us in Jersey were chasing mosquito trucks on our bikes, right? People know a lot more now, and J&J is not running commercials because everybody knows dust generally. Not that it causes cancer, but you don't want to breathe in a lot of dust. And so, you know, those commercials were shown to make it just kind of make the company look bad. No evidence that any of the plaintiffs saw them. And they're talking about the fact that people, uh, have, there's been these incidents of choking here. And then they say, if we include travel item more than unavoidable trace amounts, uh, we can't, we, we may not able, be able to say that, that, that it's safe to, to breathe. Because we don't know. We, we've tested it with the trace amounts. And then they go on to say, don't use it. Don't use this mine beyond the absolute min minimum, the trace we already have. Like a good company would. We're not going to use this mine that has anything more than these trace uh, good fragments. 
but they'll show you these documents and I suggest to you pull out sentences out of context to suggest to you that something sinister was going on. This company doing the right thing. Let's look at alternative sources and not use them uh, if we're not sure they're safe. They'll show you this document, I'm sure, that says, this is not new. Acting like, ooh, we know there's trace asbestos, right? And I submit to you, they might not show you this part where it makes clear it's tremolite. The good tremolite, not asbestos. This is not new. Yeah, it's not. The FDA and we knew that there were trace amounts of the good rock. There's trace amounts of the good rock everywhere. And then, plaintiff's exhibit 1458, talking about, remember this one, we said, oh, J&J &J didn't want to use the concentration method because it was too sensitive. Well, then you heard, we ran, we had Dr. Pooley and we had the Colorado School of Mines run a whole bunch of our samples through the concentration method. They came up clean. There's never any asbestos found in our product from the concentration method. But the concentration method, Dr. Pooley tried it out, FDA tried it out, we tried it. We were interested in using the best, well, why are we paying McCrone all this money to do TEM if we didn't care about finding asbestos if it was there? That's why we had these experts try all these methods. And in the concentration method, here's Dr. Pooley's report, Defense Exhibit 8011. September 12, 1973. He's talking about concentration here. And they've been adding, they're spiking it to test it, right? Why are you spiking it to test it if you already have asbestos in it, as plain as alleged? But he says that heavy liquid separation is a very inaccurate and unsuitable technique to adopt. That was the expert's conclusion. That's why the FDA and J&J &J and others aren't using it for testing on how and then they showed you this document, plaintiff's 1458. It says, oh, look, they didn't want to use it because it was too sensitive. Well, it's like if you have a Geiger counter on the beach and you keep finding seashells instead of metal or jewelry, you keep finding the regular rock instead of asbestos. Yeah, you don't want that. You want a method that finds the asbestos, not a method that finds stuff that's not asbestos. And both the FDA and the ex independent experts rejected the concentration method as a good way to find <coughs> asbestos in town, particularly because, as their experts agreed, the concentration method can't find the most common find form of asbestos. Then they told they talked to Dr. <coughs> Dr. Hopkins about this document. I think Mr. Panettier talking in the length about it, Planet Exhibit 2549. October 5th, 1974. It's a review meeting at J&J. &J. And remember this, he kept trying, the plaintiff's lawyer kept trying to get Dr. Hopkins to agree that J&J &J had concerns about using TEN. That J&J had grave concern. Remember that? But Dr. Hopkins said, this is an outside, the CFTA is an outside industry group. And we were reporting on what other people were saying at the meeting. And why would J&J &J have grave concerns in 1974, well, they've already been using TEM. They've already had, so you saw their, it was part of their regular quality assurance protocol since 1973, using it in some form since 71, but on a regular basis since 73. So why? That's not J&J. We're already using it. Again, choosing to mislead you, spinning the company documents in a way inconsistent with the facts, inconsistent with the truth. They'll probably show you that one again, too. Then the round robin testing. Companies and the FDA doing what you hope they would do, trying out a way to make sure they can find asbestos in talc, trying out all kinds of testing methodology, and then testing it to see if it works. And so this is a March 1977 defense to the 8.012. And they're testing tremolite. And they say this is the regular tremolite, the good kind, not, should not be detected as asbestos. And then you remember the plaintiff's lawyer saying, oh, well, why would you use asbestos? You know, something about if you're looking for grapes, why would you put oranges? If you're looking for oranges, why wouldn't you put grapes? But then you heard the truth was they did use this UISCC is asbestos. Anthophoid asbestos, you saw the paper, that's an asbestos standard. So they tested as you should with the non-asbestos and the asbestos to see if the labs could find the asbestos 
and then tell the difference between the good rock and the bad rock. And it turns out that some labs could in this initial test, and some labs could with using the polarized light and the x-ray. And if we turn to page four, if that's what's in it, this is it was clear that at five out of the seven labs could tell the difference between the good and the bad, and all of these folks found the asbestos. And then there was some follow-up because some labs missed it. And there's follow-up with the FDA involved, as you see. Dr. Gates, Dr. S, Dr. Gates from the FDA, and Dr. Wilson from the FDA and industry. And Macron came in to make sure the people doing the testing at these various companies were doing it the right way. Macron gave them instructions, they gave them protocols, uh, and then there was a retest, as you saw, in March, uh, about a year later, in March of 78. It talks about uh, closing a table which breaks the code for the recently completed task force on round robin. And the plaintiffs highlight this part, this is, this is the plaintiff's highlight, this part and this part, that we're only going to show you your own results, but they don't highlight this part where the, the results show that none of the company's products in these tests had any asbestos. They left that part out. That's what was, none of the company's products had any asbestos. That was the results. And they highlight this, destroy the code, right? Sounds nefarious, sounds terrible. So destroy the code where you find no asbestos. And then it turns out they had to destroy the code because some lawyer said you got antitrust problems if everybody else knows what, it was, what, what is in everybody's product. So the lawyer said in order to avoid any antitrust lawsuits from the government, you got to do it this way. But everything's sinister, right? That was the code to the results where nobody found any asbestos in the product. I bet they talked about the round robin. And then the FDA, after the retest, and industry was satisfied that the Polaroid's light mice microscopy and the XRD defined asbestos down to one-tenth of one percent. Uh, and that was a pretty good test to use. But J&J &J was doing one step better. They were going down to millions and millions of a percent using TEM as well as the other two to make sure that babies weren't being harmed, that people weren't being harmed, to make sure that they had the safest product on the market. And still doing that extensive testing um, today. Then, I suspect they'll show you this. Oh, J&J &J told FDA that 1% asbestos, in, uh, uh, 1 asbestos was safe for babies. No such thing. You heard Dr. Hopkins say, we have zero tolerance. That's why we're doing all of this extensive testing. That's why we're having the best labs in the world look at it. Again, mischaracterizing what the evidence and what the documents say. Here's a, a document, Plaintiff's Trial Exhibit 2506 from, uh, this is a meeting with FDA uh, and J&J, &J, and they're talking about a symposium where Mount Sinai people admitted their analysis based on optical microscopy of our product was wrong. And then they're talking about talking uh, uh, further discussions with the FDA. Uh, and then they talk about the guy from FDA, Dr. Ironman, he's focused on this OSHA limit. And OSHA, as you might remember, had a standard that uh, for people that were working in occupations that you could have 1% um, asbestos. Anything 1% below was fine as in an occupational setting. So this guy from FDA was focused on that. And he asked J&J, &J, can you do an analysis to see how your product, assuming there was any asbestos, stands up to the 1%. Now, we didn't think there should be any asbestos in it, but the government asked you to do something, you do it. And so we did this analysis, and we set our calculation under his test. You can have substantial amounts. But then the FDA, someone else at the FDA said, this guy who asked for this analysis is a knucklehead, basically. He said, Dr. Whitaker at FDA appeared skeptical of Dr. Ironman's approach. Of course, nobody wants 1% asbestos in anything. J, J never believed that. But when this guy from the FDA asked for it, they did the analysis. And so it's not fair for them to say, oh, yes, J&J &J concluded that 1% asbestos uh, was okay. That is not the truth at all. Zero tolerance. No asbestos. That's why we did all of this testing. And J&J &J goes on to say, and they've showed you this, and this is the truth. 
James, stress James, James full, uh, policy full cooperation with FDA. If there's any scientific studies that show any question of safety of talc, we're going to pull it off the market. If there's any credible evidence about the safety, we would pull it off the market. And you know what? Johnson and Johnson's getting hit, as you saw, with all of these lawsuits. And, you know, they could pull it off the market and stop this, but it's not right. It's safe. They're going to stand by and give people a choice. If your product's safe, you don't. I mean, they could to avoid being sued, but it's not right. And sometimes you stand, I mean, they, they, they could pay money in lawsuits and, and get out, but sometimes, you know what? Sometimes lawsuits have gone too far. And when you have a history... This is completely outside the record. Objection is sustained. I'm striking that completely from the record. The jury's not to consider it. Let's move on. Sometimes you stand up for what you believe in, and you stand up for the truth. Then they're going to show you this document, I'm sure. Again, everything's sinister. Um, this is plaintiff exhibit 2415. Your, your Honor, I'm going to object to that characterization, too. It's completely outside of these evidence. So, two two problems. One is, is this has got to be the sixth or seventh time counsel has has accused us, us of saying something sinister, something sinister. That's the first thing. The second thing is, now counsel has said we're not settling these lawsuits. Right, we stand up for what's right. Well, that's not true. But it's Johnson and Johnson. Johnson, 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 Johnson
instead of saying we have almost none, we say we have a few tremolite rods in both samples. Not that we have almost no tremolite. Right? We say we have tremolite rods. It's actually worse for J&J. &J. But they want to make it sound like something nefarious is going on, right? Do not use. Okay? We, we told the FDA something worse because McCrone said we can't substantiate the levels. And then you saw there was a lot of discussion about the Rubino study. And J&J &J funded that first Rubino. Uh, Dr. Rubino was the Italian um, scientist who did a study of the millers and miners in uh, Italy, um, in first in 1976 and then one in 79. And there was some suggestion that J&J &J, um, influenced or dictated or somehow wrote his paper for him. You heard that his English was not his first language, and he had debriefed, as you heard, J&J &J on his results. And so J&J &J suggested a discussion and conclusion section. But then you heard Dr. Rubino through his translator into media, media. He said basically, thanks, but no, thanks, but no thanks. It was impossible to use your discussion and conclusion. I'm not taking it. And then you see that Rubino's work is a sound statistical study. The method used and the results presented with absolute objectiv objectivity will certainly be accepted by everybody. They're very, they're very important. No evidence that J&J &J had any influence at all. In fact, as you saw, some of Dr. Rubino's results were bad for J&J. &J. The miners and millers were dying from dust disease, not from cancer, not from mesothelioma, but from pneumoconiosis and talcosis. So if we were trying to rig a study, you'd think we'd come out with a great study. No, it shows the millers and miners were getting this horrible dust disease. They weren't getting cancer from these high exposures. And then they claim that we funded, J&J &J funded the second Rubino study there was a budget line item for it, but then ultimately, here's the evidence, Defense Exhibit 8413. There is no interest in such a study at our end. We already had the 76 study. Remember, Dr. Rubino did another study with a different control group. We had nothing to do with the second study. No interest in such a study on our end. And then, Dr. Rubino, or his intermediary as a courtesy, gave us a pre-publication draft, gave J&J a pre-publication draft of his second study. And there was a suggestion that somehow J&J took out deaths. Do you remember that? Not the truth. Not supported by the evidence. I'm going to show you what you saw in the trial. Remember, they showed you this graph about these cancers. And then compared to the final report, you saw that all of the causes, the all cause deaths were the same. The numbers were, let's see if I can make these both fit on this page for you. The numbers were the same in the all cause. So the published paper, which is at the bottom, same numbers, 560, 560, 4469, 125, 193, 16 were same. All cause deaths were fully reported and Rubino's final paper said the same thing as his first paper. In conclusion, our findings show there's no relationship has been found between Italian tap exposure and cancer, whereas pneumoconosis may be observed. No cancers. But the dust, we know they got tons of exposure because they had this pneumoconosis, the scarring in the lungs. And then there was a suggestion that, uh, remember uh, Mr. Panettiere suggesting Dr. Hopkins Somehow you influenced Dr. Rubino from keeping out mention of these other larynx, esophagus, stomach cancer. But then you looked at the first paper on the same Millers and Miners. Every single one of those deaths was reported. I'm going to mess Mr. Rose. Um, every single one of those deaths, and we walked through this chart. The, the, uh, lung, bronchial, esophageus, stomach, all reported in the peer-reviewed published literature. Again, any, the suggestions, the allegations, just not fair, not supported by the evidence. It's all in there for people to see. And that's the one J&J &J funded. They reported all the deaths and, and the reasons. 
and you saw in the pre-publication draft, and you saw Dr. Diaz say there was these other deaths because of alcohol consumption, cirrhosis of the liver, esophageal and stomach cancer related to heavy drinking uh, from the miners and millers. Allegations not supported by the evidence. Then they accused Dr. I'm sorry, they accused the guy, Roger Miller. Oh, before I get to that. Um, they also suggested that that I or Dr. Diet was um, doing something funny with the numbers in the minor and miller studies. Remember that? But then we showed you our demonstrative and, and compared it with the World Health Organization numbers. And they matched it, they were the same, except I had actually left off, and Dr. Diet had actually left off 418. We undercounted the number of people actually studied. Then they showed you in their cross of Dr. Diet. Remember Dr. Diet was the epidemiologist, and, and he was the only epidemiologist called in this case. Ask yourself why they didn't bring an expert on disease causation. We're in the middle of a place where there are fortunately are tons of doctors. New York, Philadelphia, here in New Brunswick, Washington DC, Baltimore, Boston. Your epidemiologist Google, the very profession that studies the causes of disease. They didn't bring you one. We're the only ones who brought you a disease causation expert. Some of that studies uh, does studies on disease causation, whether a substance causes a disease an absence of proof on their side. And then Dr. Diet was cross-examined about this. He's saying, oh, you, you guys said there's 7,000 minors in Miller studies, but you're double counting. Remember the thing, oh, if I count Chris and Chris and me and then I count them again. But then you saw it's just simple math. It's just adding the numbers, the actual numbers in each of the studies. and counting the number of the, the, the 67 years for Italy, 26 for Vermont, it actually should be 93, how many years they were studied. And Dr. Diet made clear during my exam of his, his that Dr. Rubino's study was on the same miller minor group twice, a different cohort, and that it's good to study a group twice. You get more information. You learn uh, more about the validity of your results. He also said that thousands, half or more, were studied only, only once. And so, again, Allegations and suggestions not consistent with the evidence. They accused poor Roger Miller, who ran the Windsor, Vermont mine, of perjury. Remember that? Yeah, she said perjury. I had a lot of nerve after Dr. Wongo swore seven times that he never tested talc before this lawsuit turned out not to be true. But here is um, Dr. This is uh, Roger Miller's affidavit that they showed you, and he said in this lawsuit. No evidence of the presence of asbestos in Windsor Mine product has ever been revealed by this testing. And you know why he said it? It was the truth. Here is Macron's report. And Roger Miller, this is July 1987. Macron is sending this in May 87, just a few months before. And Macron is telling Roger Miller, copied on this, the same guy who signed the affidavit, that's lab in the world is telling them that Windsor product is free of asbestos. That has always been our opinion and continues to be our opinion based on 15 years of closely examining the product. The best lab in the world is telling the head of J&J's mind that they don't have any asbestos in their finished product. And based on that, Roger Miller signed this because it was the truth. Then they Remember Nancy Musco, the burn nurse whose video was up there, and they asked her again and again about these answers to interrogatories. And when you get sued, the way J and J has uh, again and again. No, the lawsuits are in evidence. You're going to leave them in. Side. You, you're on all the drive. You just keep going. That's all the drive. Yeah. And they pointed out that in this response, in this one lawsuit, Dr. Musco, with assistance from attorneys, when she signed this report, this, this one, sir. Oh, 
for a signature. The question was, describe in detail all process, procedures, and testing performed upon the talc used in the manufacture of Johnson's baby powder to reduce or eliminate the existence of asbestos, tremolite, or other contaminants in Johnson's baby powder. And the answer was, to the best of defendants' knowledge, talc used in the manufacture of Johnson's baby powder never contained asbestos in any form or tremolite. Well, somebody messed up. As we told the FDA, as you saw, we did have trace amounts of tremolite, but somebody meant to say tremolite asbestos, but the fact that somebody messed up, some lawyer or whoever helped answer, the fact that somebody messed up answering hundreds of different interrogatory answers from lawsuits, the fact that somebody made a mistake doesn't mean there's asbestos in talcum powder, powder. And they say that. It's never contained asbestos. It did contain trace amounts of tremolite, so that was wrong. Somebody made a mistake, but that doesn't mean that there's asbestos in baby powder. But I'm sure you'll hear about that in their closing as well. Then they showed you this document. Remember the discussion about the animal testing? And there was a suggestion, oh, you did all this special testing for the animals that you didn't do for the people, and you made sure that the, that the animal stuff was clean, so, uh, so you would look good in these studies. Not the truth, not the evidence. Here's the document. 228P was a lot. And you do, when you do testing, you do trace a lot. If something goes wrong, you want to know where the word came from. So they did segregate, and they know where the stuff came from. But then you saw this note. They pulled it out of the regular production lot. It's the lot baby powder, a thousand cans set aside for everybody to do everything. They pulled it out of the regular production line. And that's the point. It's the same baby powder used by everybody. It's clean. There's no asbestos. They pulled it right out of the production line. They're tracking it for the animal studies. There's not a single, as you've heard Dr. Atanis and Dr. Diet talk about our two causation experts, uh, and Dr. Atanis is one of the world-leading experts on this. They didn't bring you a single expert who's published one study on peritoneal mesothelioma. Not one. None of their experts have published anything in the scientific literature. I've done no research or published on mesothelioma. Dr. Tanius has published the biggest study on peritoneal mesothelioma. He's published other studies on peritoneal mesothelioma. That's why he's on these international boards when you have hard diagnoses for mesothelioma. That's why he's on the U.S. and Canadian board and on the international board. He is one of the world's leading experts in mesothelioma, and particularly peritoneal mesothelioma. And Dr. Diet is not only a pulmonologist, but also an environmental exposure expert. They didn't bring you either one of those kinds of experts. And he's also an epidemiologist. They didn't bring you one of those disease causation. And both Dr. Tanus and Dr. Diaz talk about the fact that there is not a single study, not even a case report, not even a crappy study. There's no study that says J and J cause mesothelioma in anybody. There's none. In fact, there's no published study that says J&J has product has asbestos in it. There's nothing in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. A product that's on, been on the market for 125 years, been on the market for people to test for years. Not a single, what are the chances? There's a bad study about everything. Apples, coffee, anything. There's not a single study in the peer-reviewed published literature that J&J baby powder causes mesothelioma or has asbestos in it. Not that says J&J. They want to suggest, oh, this one is about J&J. No, there's nothing in the paper that says J&J. Because that's the truth. There's no science. There's no evidence. They want to use this study by a Dr. Gordon. He's a plaintiff's expert, which they've acknowledged. A plaintiff's expert in lawsuits. It's a study funded by and paid for by attorneys for lawsuits. And it's about a product that's not Johnson & Johnson. It's cashmere bouquet. Not J and J. Why don't they bring you a study about J and J? Because there is none. Then they showed you a document created by the plaintiff's lawyers. They have a plaintiff's number on it, but for ID it's defense exhibit 750669. And they're claiming that this testing board. Oh, look, all of this shows that there's asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. Not the truth. 
First of all, most of it doesn't even say asbestos. It says amphibole, tremolite, actinolite, the good rock. Then you saw that they put stuff up here when the underlying testing documents say on their face, there's no asbestos. Why are they doing that? If you have real evidence, why do you have to do that? Why do you put stuff in there where it says no asbestos? And so just to give you an example of what some of what was going on here, January 30th, 87. January 30th, 87. Okay. Here it is. They say amphiboles, amphiboles, suggesting that that's asbestos, right? But then you look at the January 30th paper, the test, it says no fibrous forms are observed. No asbestos. It says the complete opposite of what they're suggesting to you. Why do they do that? If you have real evidence, why do you have to do that? March 30th, 87, same. Put it up here, amphibole, suggesting that that's asbestos. Then you look at March 30th, 87, test result. No fibrous form observed. No asbestos. Not supported by the evidence. And then one other example, there's plenty we went through with Dr. Hopkins, but in the interest of time, we'll go to September 72. <coughs> September 72. And that is here. September 72. Did you take it right? Oh, you're too fast. September um, 72, and here it is, September 72, here, here's what the actual document says. Here's Dr. Cooley testing the Italian towel that was used in Great Britain, and you heard it's just with 5-0 is the one used in the ESS. It says some trebolite was found, but none, none was asbestiform. They put it up there when the actual test says no asbestos. Why do they do that if they have evidence? No asbestos. Lawyer created testing board, not supported by the evidence. And then, go back to the, um, you know, briefly through, you guys saw the government, I want to talk about the rocks, I know it's not that exciting, but I want to talk about the rocks briefly. Uh, you saw some government reports that disagreed with the plaintiff's case about uh, that all rocks are bad rocks, this, this notion that cleavage fragments are, are harmful. And I want to show you that. That's Defense Exhibit 9052 and 9053. And these are the reports from the U.S. Department of Interior. And they talk about the fact that just because something's fibrous doesn't mean it's asbestos. This is fibrous, non-asbestos tremolite, right? Just because you're mashing it up in the milling and mining doesn't mean it's asbestos. That's the government. And then they show you what asbestos really looks like. And I want to show you this because I want to talk about Dr. Longo's lab and what they found. This is what asbestos really looks like, kind of like asbestos. And they show you in this government report what cleavage fragments look like. They're not the hairy rocks, right? They're just straight up fragments, the non-asbestos cleavage fragments. And then they talk about, in the other part of the, another government report, 9053, you guys have seen this. They talk about, again, they show you what ampholite and tremolite asbestos looks like, right? That's the hairy, the hairy kind of rock. And they talk about the fact that cleavage fragments, talk about the fact that just because it's fibrous, it's not asbestos in here. The term fiber is not limited to asbestos. And they talk about how the fibrous, there are fibrous non-asbestiform things when fibrous talc doesn't make it harmful or, or asbestos. And then they talk about cleavage fragments. That's what they look like, right? And how cleavage fragments are not asbestos, right? However, because they, this is the government, these fragments can be elongated. However, because they did not uh, grow as fibers, they cannot have the same characteristics as fibers, characteristically, Cleavage fragments are not called fibers. They distinguish. And maybe some of you remember when Mr. Hans here handed out these pictures to you, claiming this is asbestos, this is asbestos. Maybe some of you noticed this. 
and I want to just put it up. This is, and I'm going to identify it uh, as M69042-002BL-001. And he showed you this, suggesting it was asbestos. But look what the analysts at Dr. Longo's lab wrote. They didn't write anthophylline asbestos, did they? They didn't write asbestos at all. They just said anthophylline. And you know you can have the good anthophylline and you can have the anthophylline asbestos. And they didn't write anthophylline asbestos. Maybe some of you noticed that. Why do you think they didn't bring those testers here, the ones that actually did the test? They weren't finding asbestos. Maybe some of you noticed on the second picture the same thing. It doesn't say asbestos. It just says anthophylite. And it doesn't look anything like what the government report says the anthophylite asbestos look like. It's not the hairy rock. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to go back? So I submit to you the plaintiff's case is based on confusion and based on cherry picking lines out of the document without showing you the truth. And we disclose, here's submissions to the FDA. Remember, Mr. Panettiere had the, and he still has it over there, the inbox, outbox, right? This is what went to the FDA, what went to the world. We told them, we told the FDA we have some tremolite. Not as best informed, but we have it. Told the FDA, submission, other submissions to the FDA, that we have tre tremolite and actinolite. We told them about the tremolite rods. It wasn't a secret. It was disclosed to the FDA. In fact, we told the FDA, we didn't think it was asbestos, but if you want to you consider it, we said, this talc contains essentially no anthophyllite and only minor amounts below 1% of tremolite and actinolite, or in other words, contains less than 1%, if any, asbestos particles. We didn't think it was, but if you want to say it's asbestos particles, we have it. We, we told the FDA that was part of the disclosures. To su suggest that J&J was hiding that, not the truth. We told the FDA, fully disclosed. We told the FDA when they were considering regulations, I guess some companies had suggested you could wash out asbestos. We said that is not true. We told the FDA the assumptions we believe to be incorrect are as follows, that how can be processed to remove asbestos. We told them you can't wash it out. That's why we did all this testing for it. Fully disclosed to the FDA what was in our product and that you couldn't. Did I mess this up here? I'm frozen. I'm frozen. Apologies. Oh, there we go. Fix. Okay. Then you saw that there were different definitions in the government. Actually, the government had consistent definitions. And you saw that one of the things, again, I submit the plaintiff's case is based on confusion. And it's confusing. They're trying to confuse you between what is regular old good rocks that you see in the environment every day and harmful stuff. But then you saw that just because it says amphibole, most rocks are not asbestos. Overwhelming majority, 99 point something percent of rocks are not asbestos. And that's true for their experts acknowledge that tremolite does not necessarily mean asbestos. Anthophylite does not mean asbestos necessarily. And actinolite does not mean asbestos because there's two kinds of those things. And the EPA, OSHA, the Mineral, the, the Mining Safety and Health Agency will all make a distinction. All of them agree with J&J's &J position in this case and with Dr. Atanas's position that there's a difference between asbestos tremolite, asbestos anthopolite, and asbestos actinolite. And to be asbestos, to be the harmful kind, it has to be the asbestiform kind. And why define, ask yourself, if they say it doesn't matter, right? Dr. Weber said it doesn't matter, it's three to one. Then why are all these government agencies and testing rooms, why do they define it? Why do they say it has to be the asbestiform if it doesn't matter? Because it does matter. And OSHA, the government did a fairly extensive analysis that you looked at, looking at all the science on um, asbestos and on non-asbestos, anthophylite, actinolite, and tremolite, these good rocks. And they concluded, looking at the human studies, looking at the animal studies, looking at cell studies, they concluded, this is the government, again, people that have no interest in this case, right? 
OSHA has made a determination that substantial evidence is lacking to conclude that non-asbestiform tremolite and thophylite and actinolite present the same type or magnitude of health effects as asbestos. So the government disagrees with plaintiff's case. They say you have to look, you have to know whether it's asbestos or not, because the non-asbestos kind of rock is not harmful. And it's not just OSHA. Multiple government agencies have looked at this issue. Here's the uh, Department of Interior testing some talc and saying the tremolite fragment noted in the report is not asbestos, but rather normal rock-forming amphibole, which is ubiquitous in the Earth's crust. Regular old tremolite, they're saying, is not asbestos. Normal. FDA agrees. They had searched the literature without success to find any report on the toxicity of tremolite. FDA knows we have tremolite. Occasionally we had it uh, as an invisible fragment, like all of us breathe every day. And they say, no evidence it's toxic. Same thing for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. No evidence of a hazard from non-asbestos cleavage fragments. In fact, studies dealing with non-asbestiform tremolite or other cleavage fragments have not thus far shown any indication of a carcinogenic health hazard. They don't agree with the plaintiff's case, the government, that cleavage fragments, three to one, are harmful. And why, did, maybe some of you thought about this, why if they're claiming there's asbestos in baby powder, are they talking about cleavage fragments? It's like plan B. They can't tell you that there's asbestos. Oh, let's, let's argue that the, the good rock's bad. They're arguing about cleavage fragments because there's no asbestos in baby powder, and they know it. That's why, why, why would they bring up this whole cleavage fragment thing? Dr. Blount, we looked at, she disagrees with them. No good evidence for adverse effects of these regular old cleavage fragment rocks. And here's an example. We, we looked at a cleavage fragment. If you mash it up, it could have the same ratio if you mash it up as an asbestos fiber, three to one. It doesn't make it asbestos. Their experts agree. Just because you we take non-asbestos tremolite and crush it up, that doesn't magically make it asbestos. That is correct. And that would be the same for anthophylite, actinolite, non-asbestos rocks like tremolite. Just because you mash it up, it doesn't magically become asbestos. And, but that's the trick here. That's the plaintiff's expert's trick, I, su I submit to you. What they're doing is calling the regular old good rock asbestos. Because they have to, because there's no asbestos in baby powder or shower to shower. And they actually admit it to you in cross-examination that that's what they're doing. That the structure, so it was the same picture we just looked at, that the structure comes from breaking apart non-asbestos tremolite. You would agree with me that it does not magically, in fact, become asbestos. Yes, sir, I've already agreed. But you would count it and report it in your report as asbestos. If your hypothetical is true, yes. They were reported as asbestos even if it's not. And Dr. Compton agreed the same thing. You asked me to assume it's not, I would count it even though you're telling me it's not. That's the trick. That is the trick. And maybe some of you got it early on. They are calling non-asbestos Regular old cleavage fragment rocks that we encounter every day in our yards, outside, in the world, they're calling it asbestos, even if it's not. That is the lawsuit trick that their experts are selling. Why would they have to call, why would they have to talk about cleavage fragments if they're really finding asbestos? And then Dr. Wongo, he came in here, their $31 million guy, he said, oh, the government makes me count, they make me count. Even if it's not as best as if it's three to five to one, they make me count. Well, that's not the truth. The government doesn't make him count. The government says they're easily distinguishable. Cleavage fragments are easily distinguishable from true asbestos. Using these microscopic techniques, PLM, you can tell the difference. You can tell the hairy rock from the straight up cleavage fragment. And the uh, regulator said for purposes of regulation, the mineral must be one of the six. It must be asbestos in the growth ha habit. And they, they, they made fun, oh, we don't ask the rock how they grow. You don't have to ask the rock. You can see, is it the hairy rock or not? That's the point. That's why the government defines it differently. And you heard Dr. Atanas talk about how dimensions matter, how there's fiber strength with asbestos that you don't find with cleavage fragments, that they break apart more easily. So you can exhale them like we exhale all kinds of dust we encounter every day. That's why there is a difference. And Dr. Longo's own testing method, 
he testified he used the ISO, the stand, this industry, not industry, this testing standard organization's method. But then we looked at the definitions with him. His own standard makes him discriminate. You can't. You, the government doesn't make you count. His own testing standard doesn't make him count. It says it's necessary to discriminate between the asbestos form and non asbestos form analogs. You got is this the hairy rock, the bad rock, or is this just regular old stuff we see every day, invisible, ultra trace, microscopic, that all of us inhale and breathe out every day? You gotta tell the difference. There's a big difference. Something's going on in Dr. Longo's lab, right? You guys saw this? His error rate test? How could it be? How could it be that people in his lab are seeing absolutely nothing in a sample, and other people are seeing a whole bunch of bundles? What kind of lab is that? Some people are seeing fibers, some people are seeing nothing, some people are seeing bundles. Only one sample they all agreed on. 91% error rate in this test. What's going on there? Then you, you heard this. Dr. Longo's lab in seven, I'm sorry, eight samples of Johnson's baby powder. We found asbestos, right? But then he sent it out to another plaintiff's lab and even that lab said, you know what, we looked at these eight samples, there ain't, there ain't no asbestos here. There's nothing. How can that be? Dr. Longo, asbestos, 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 eight times. And the other lab finds nothing. He's like, oh, that's because my guy looked at it longer. Well, then you saw there wasn't enough hours in the day to do what Dr. Longo claimed he did. And you heard about this. Something's going on at that lab, right? The FDA said there were some problems, but he didn't want to talk about it. FDA audited Dr. Longo's dent lab, and they found problems. <coughs> you didn't want to talk about it. What's your common sense tell you about that? And then picture after picture, as he sat here and said, that's asbestos, that's asbestos. Not one of them said asbestos. You heard Dr. Hopkins, you saw the test results. When you find asbestos, you write asbestos. McConnell wrote asbestos, tremolite, not asbestos, anthopolite, not anthopolite, asbestos. And then you look, this is in evidence, this defense is given 8892. You look at what the government pictures of asbestos look like, right? Tremolite asbestos. It's nothing like Dr. Longo, what Dr. Longo is saying asbestos is. It looks nothing like it, because it's not. It's fragments of the regular, microscopic, almost invisible, almost not measurable traces of the good rock. Okay, oh, Karen, I'm having a problem with it. Is it me or is it you? Probably me. There you go, I'm sorry. Uh, and here is a, uh, another government document where they show you a picture, the hairy rock, anthopolite asbestos. Dr. Longo saying this is an anthopolite bundle. It looks nothing like it. it. Looks nothing like it at all. In fact, his investigators just say it's regular old anthopolite. Why did they bring him here to talk to you? Government says, here's a picture of a Cleveland fragment. Looks just like what Dr. Longo is saying is asbestos, right? What the government says is a Cleavage fragment looks just like what Dr. Longo says is asbestos. Another example, government says Cleavage fragment, Dr. Longo says is asbestos, looks nothing like asbestos. What's going on here? The difference between science and the real world, and lawsuit fiction, a lawsuit story without evidence. Maybe they can believe, maybe Dr. Longo will get some jurors to believe what he's selling. And maybe not this jury. Folks here are not that naive. That comment is tricky from the record. Use your common sense and ask yourself, ask yourself, how could it be that the most common of products, hundreds of millions of people have used Johnson's Calcium Potter? How could it be that one of the most common, one of, one of the most widely used products in history over 125 years causes the rarest, rarest. <clears throat> Dr. Diaz, our epidemic, super rare, less than one in a million. How can it be that the most common of products causes the most uncommon? Almost nobody, less than a million a year, 300 people a year, super rare. And ask yourself, when you look at the government SEER data, Dr. Diaz says, their, their claim here doesn't add up. If they're right that diapering a baby from zero to three years with baby powder causes mesothelioma, which is their claim, 
then how, how can you have a graph like this? Average latency is 20 to 40 years. Dr. Diaz, you'd expect this spike to be right up here, right? After 20, 30, 40 years, you're not here. It should be, it doesn't make any sense. It would be right up here. Where are the mesotheliomas on this graph? If what they're saying is true. That, that exposure from zero to three with a latency of 20 to 40 years, you'd see that spike way, way sooner. <clears throat> but Dr. Diaz said it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Not consistent with the science. They claim that mesothelioma is a signal tumor. It has to be from asbestos. And I think they showed you a document for some, some, somebody at J&J that actually said, said something like that. But I think it's hundreds of scientists, thousands of people. Because somebody said something in a document that's wrong, doesn't make it right. And all the scientific studies you look at showed that asbestos, asbestos exposure in peritoneal meso is far less obvious. Far less obvious. It's not a signal tumor when it comes to the abdominal kind. Published paper, this is the one by both, both sides experts, Dr. Atanius and an expert for the plaintiff. You saw that disclosure. Both sides experts agree. And you know, Dr. Atanius, unlike the plaintiff's expert, has published in the peer-reviewed literature. He's subjected his opinions to peer-reviewed scientific scrutiny. And they said, yes, this is reliable. We're going to publish it. None of their experts have published anything on peritoneal mesothelioma and its causes. And what this peer-reviewed paper by both sides experts say is that in, pro in approximately 60 to 90 percent of mesos in U.S. women, plural 60, 90 percent in peritoneal, and a substantial portion of peritoneal mesos in men are, un are likely unrelated to asbestos. It's a paper by both sides experts, unrelated to asbestos. And it goes on to say that historically peritoneal mesos feelings were associated with heavy commercial amphibose asbestos exposure. Sex exposures are now uncommon, and currently the epidemiological evidence correlating time train trends, incidents at both sexes, and asbestos exposure suggest that a much smaller fraction of tumors in men are related to asbestos, and very few of them. So it's more likely than not that peritoneal meso is not related to asbestos, according to the science. Darren? Anybody get a new clicker? Oh, you got it, thanks. Um, then this study, 22 leading experts on mesothelioma. Recent, hot off the presses, the, the cancer journal. And these lead, and, and I think the place, well, this isn't from Memorial Sloan Kettering or Mount Sinai. Well, it's from all of the leading experts from these institutions. And these guys and gals, they're not here. They're published. They're not here to win lawsuits. They're publishing a paper, trying to help people. Here are treatment suggestions for doctors, right? Twenty-one of them have no. Twenty. Tw I think there was a defense expert and a plaintiff's expert on the paper in the disclosure. Twenty of them have no interest in the litigation at all. Memorial Sloan Kettering doctor, Mount Sinai doctor, Harvard doctor, Mayo Clinic, M.D. Anderson, Rutgers. Robert Wood, University of California, some of the best medical institutions in the world these folks are from, writing a paper to try to help people. And in the peer-reviewed science, they're reliable, determined to be reliable and, and publishable, they say that peritoneal mesothelioma is rarely associated with asbestos exposure. That's what the leading experts, most recent study, that peritoneal mesothelioma is rarely associated. Only 8% reported exposure. Way more likely than not that peritoneal meso is not caused by asbestos exposure, according to this brand new study from some of the leading experts in the field from some of the best cancer uh, centers in the world. And then you saw in the even in the document they rely on, the Helsinki criteria, and even their experts acknowledge, typically with peritoneal meso, the abdominal kind, you need really heavy exposure. Right? You heard Dr. Atani say, because you've got to get it all the way. You have to overcome all of our body's defenses about expelling these fibers and get it down all the way into the peritoneal area. And so the papers talk about heavy, heavy exposure. And here, they're not alleging. They're alleging trace. Doesn't add up, right? How are you getting it down? You've got 17 million, so even if they're right and they're not, there's asbestos. How is trace a heavy enough exposure to cause peritoneal mesothelioma? When typically you see it in insulation workers, people have heavy daily exposure to asbestos. And you talk, you heard a lot about biomarkers in this case. And that is, a, and their own experts have admitted biomarkers are objective evidence. It's something the juries can look at and say, yes, 
there's evidence of asbestos exposure? Is there evidence in the CAT scans? Is there evidence in the lungs? Is there evidence in the x-ray? Is there evidence in the tissue? Are there, t are there fibers in the tissue? that I can say, aha, uh -huh, that person was exposed to asbestos. And if you breathe, and you heard the experts, if you breathe enough asbestos, you get scarring. You can't get scarring in your lungs, or you get asbestos evidence that you've been exposed, because you're working so hard, right, to get, uh, to expel fibers. You have that evidence, and their expert said you look for it. That Helsinki criteria that they rely on, remember, they say you look for it. Where's the biological evidence? And you folks are looking for evidence when you're deciding this case. Where's the evidence that these plants were exposed? And Dr. Diaz told you that the overwhelming majority of people with peritoneal meso, because of the heavy exposure, they have these biomarkers. Because it takes so much exposure to get through the lungs and overcome our filter systems. And then you saw the published studies agreed. In plural, you got 70%. This is a textbook by Dr. Rogley. You heard his work for plaintiffs and defendants. And then the leading expert study we just looked at by the 22 people from Mount Sinai and other uh, Harvard Sloan Kettering. Plural plaques are frequent in patients with meso. For example, they were found in 88% of asbestos exposed patients with mesothelioma. More recent studies, because the scanning is more sensitive, you heard Dr. Dia talk about, you're seeing a higher percentage. And here you heard that not a single plaintiff, four plaintiffs alleging, not alleging, four plaintiffs suffering from peritoneal mesothelioma, which the literature says you need heavy exposure to get, not a trace of biological evidence, no evidence in their lungs, no evidence in their tissue, no evidence of any scarring there lungs, no evidence that they, any of them were exposed to asbestos at all. How is that possible? What does your common sense say about it? How is it possible when you hear 88%, the overwhelming majority, 70%, the overwhelming majority of people with peritoneal meso have a marker, the scarring or some asbestosis or something in their lungs or the tissue, and all four of these platins have nothing, no biological evidence at all. And Dr. Moline, even their expert, admitted they don't, not one of them. Even So both sides' experts agree that for Mr. Barton, Mr. Ronnie, well, Dr. Moline certainly agrees that for Mr. Barton, Mr. Ronning, Mr. Etheridge, and Ms. McNeil, Dr. Moline was talking about Ms. McNeil too, not one of them has any biological evidence of asbestos exposure. The lungs are clear. Dr. Moline, there's no evidence of asbestosis or plural plaques on the radiology for any of these individuals. That is correct. Not one of our plaintiffs has any evidence of plural plaques, asbestosis, or asbestos bodies in pathology. Not that I'm aware. Where is the evidence? Dr. Longo claimed that they were exposed to millions and millions and billions of fibers of asbestos. Why nothing in their lungs? Why all their lungs are clear, according to their own expert? Why no biomarkers at all? And when you don't see any biomarkers, when you don't see any evidence of exposure, the experts, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Tanus, concluded this is the kind of cancer that happens, unfortunately, to so many people for no reason at all. And all of us have you no know, family members, have suffered through with family members, the horrors of cancer. And it is hard. I think our sympathy is so hard in a case like this. It's hard to decide a case like this when people are really suffering. Right? We've all seen family members, friends suffer. But the truth is, most people get cancer because it just happens. It's not a satisfying excuse, and it's natural to try to find a villain, a reason, a cause. And we don't blame the plaintiffs for coming to believe now that this is the reason. But it's not. It's the kind of cancer that happens to so many people. We could line the city of New Brunswick, like I told you in an opening, with people suffering from cancer, and those people have nobody to sue, and most of those people have no idea why they got it. This cancer, as Dr. Tanus explained to you and Dr. it just happens. It's a, it's a DNA mistake. And so most of the time our bodies can overcome it, but sometimes not. It just happens. And it happens to good people. And it doesn't mean that J&J is baby powder cancer. Even though I know most of us would like to find a reason and a cause, sometimes it just happens. And there's no evidence here that it happened from baby powder. There's no evidence. There's no biological markers. There's no testing evidence in their containers. There's no testing expert that they brought you and tested the final product. Mr. Etheridge 
diagnosed, you heard Dr. Maddox agree, he's been an extraordinarily rare kind of peritoneal B cell epithelioma. Ask yourself how the most common of products causes the most uncommon of disease. No evidence of asbestos exposure in his lungs or tissue. He's, and in his answer to the interrogatories in this case, he talked about three years of diapering uh, being his exposure. Uh, and no doctors ever told him that Johnson's baby powder caused his epithelium. I think Dr. Malim said there's something about, oh, well, he used it in the last 10 years, but then she acknowledged in his deposition that was, that wasn't um, sufficient exposure because you need 10 years or more. So three years of diapering is what he's alleging, 53 years later, with no biomarkers, and none of his doctors told him that baby powder was supposed. And here's Dr. Malim. This is a testimony I was talking about. There are notes that Mr. Etheridge has used talcum powder over the past 10 years when he stopped using the powder in 2016. Do you consider those recent uses a potential cause of his peritoneal meso? Answer, no. Not enough time. So we got the three years of exposure, uh, which doesn't really add up with the SEER data that we looked at in the science. Mr. Barton, we don't believe that Mr. Barton's cancer was caused by asbestos because he's got no evidence, no biological markers. But certainly, if they want to say it's asbestos, the Brooklyn Navy shipyard, there's a lot of science about shipyards in mes mesothelioma. There's asbestos all over those places, as, as you heard. We saw so many government reports talking about how much asbestos was there. We know his father worked not only at the Brooklyn Navy shipyard, but went up and down the eastern seaboard from New York down to New Orleans to Norfolk, Virginia, uh, inspecting Navy ships uh, for making sure they were, were following the got safety guidelines, etc. And then it's like, oh, he wore a suit and he worked in an office. But then you saw the studies. That if you're walking around those shipyards, if you're on those Navy ships, you're going to get exposure. And you can give secondhand exposure, like secondhand smoke, to people in your household and give them these of You know that Mr. Barton lived with his father until late in his teens before he went to college. And again, no doctor. And he saw, you don't blame him for coming to believe that this is, that baby powder was caused, he saw the lawyer advertising suggesting it was, right? Mr. Ronnie, same, no evidence of any exposure in lungs or tissues. And again, none of his doctors told him what baby powder caused him. Ms. McNeil, no biological evidence. And for women, you saw 90% of mesos in women are not caused by asbestos. And Ms. McNeil, her recent reports look like, thank goodness, she's doing pretty well for now. So it's like she's doing great. No findings suggesting a recurrence. You heard from Dr. Brody and from the government that there's asbestos back in background rates all over in more in cities, some in rural areas, and that states with shipyards tend to have higher rates. But there is asbestos in the air. And the issue is, is there going to be more than background rate? and that would increase your risk for mesothelioma. We talked about the FDA. This is from a document you saw in the case that the FDA monitors for, for potential safety problems with cosmetic products on the market and takes action when needed to protect the public health. And you heard about the citizen's petition. Your Honor, is there a time that you want me to stop for lunch? Or? Can I discuss that with you? Sure. Sidebar real quickly. Yeah. Council, can I see you? Since we're going to need a break to move our stuff around, if we can finish with yes. the council, that'd be good. Then we can move everything around. I want to make sure that's okay with the jury. And so you, you heard the FDA look at this issue in um, 1983. There was something called a citizen petition. And citizens can file a petition and it triggers a regulatory investigation by the FDA. And in 1983, there was a citizen's petition saying there are these reports of asbestos and baby powder. You should have a warning on it. And again, I submit to you the best evidence are experts that don't have an interest in this case. Forget the plaintiff's experts, forget mine. Look at what the FDA and NIOSH and OSHA, the independent experts, have done. And the FDA actually did a risk assessment. Remember they did two. First, Linda Taylor did one where she assumed 1% asbestos, 
Uh, and then there was another by a whole committee in FDA saying, well, the studies show that we can detect it with PEM down to one-tenth of one percent, and there was no reports about asbestos being more than one percent that were credible. So they used the one-tenth of one percent in their final assessment. And here's what the FDA concluded in 1986. Our scientists recently reviewed data from these surveillance activities and concluded that the risk from a worst case estimate of exposure to asbestos from cosmetic talc would be less than the risk from environmental background levels of exposure to asbestos over a lifetime. That is the independent FDA, a whole committee on risk assessment, doing an analysis, looking back, as you saw from the petition at their testing from the 70s, where they found no asbestos, and concluding, and the FDA assumed, so Dr. Longo has found like 17 millionths of a percent, 9 thousandths of a percent, so they assume like 30,000, up to 30,000 times more asbestos than Dr. Longo claims to find. They assumed one-tenth of a percent, way more than Dr. Longo claims to find, and they said, even if you have one-tenth of one percent, worst case of exposure attributed to asbestos and cosmetic talent, it's less than walking around in the air. No risk at all. I think Mr. Panettiere put three, oh, that means only three people in the whole world. No, that means nobody, according to the FDA. No risk. Independent government scientists analyzing, doing this exposure, saying, even if they're right, and they're not, that there's asbestos and talcum powder, the FDA says, no worse than walking around in the air. And they concluded there is no basis at this time for the agency to conclude that there's a health hazard attributed to asbestos and cosmetic talc. No need to require a warning label on cosmetic talc. And that is still their position today. Even after all the lawsuits reported to them, even after the press, even after everything, because the science doesn't support anything different. The science says there's no health hazard. That's what the FDA found, and they stand by it still on the market today. And they, so they realize, well, why didn't you just use cornstarch instead of it? Well, we give people a choice. Some people like cornstarch, some people like baby powder or shower to shower. And, and cornstarch has issues. You, and first, you said there's no difference between talcum powder and cornstarch in terms of the dust exposure, the ability to get into babies' lungs. This is a website that they claim is to use. Uh, also, some experts believe that using cornstarch might make diaper rash worse by spreading yeast and bacteria. And you saw that because corn is natural, it provides a growth medium that you can have microbiological organisms and cause yeast infections. And there's an explosion problem. It's really flammable. And so it's not a safer alternative. They're both safe. But cornstarch has unique issues and problems that baby powder doesn't. Not a safer alternative. Both sides' experts, Dr. Moline, Dr. Maddox, and our experts agree that talc without asbestos does not cause mesothelium. The talc without asbestos, there's no question that talc without asbestos does not cause mesothelium. And there were some questions about fibrous talc, but the truth is, and their experts agree, fibrous talc is just talc mashed up, it's not asbestos. There's no testimony that that's harmful. And you saw the animal studies, looking at when, when, when IR and the World Health Here's another independent scientific agency, right? The World Health Organization, a bunch of scientists around the world who look at what to list as a, as a cancer-causing substance, what to list as a carcinogen. And they did an extensive analysis of this issue, and they looked at things like the animal studies. And here's an animal study that Dr. Tanis talked to you about. When they gave these, I think this was rats, when they gave these rats asbestos, chrysotile, 18 of them, almost 40%, they lit up with mesothelioma. Latency was sufficient that they could get mesothelioma. But with Italian talc, same, actually even more exposure than the chrysotile, no meso, same as saline, same as water. No mesothelioma with the animals in this talc, even though the real asbestos chrysotile fossil. And then you heard about all of these Miller and Minor studies only one funded by the FDA, one by the government, Sullivan was done by NIOSH and OSHA and Harvard. Uh, all of these different investigators, different types of studies, different designs, uniform in their findings. The people, the guys with the highest level of exposure, no cancers, no mesotheliomas. And they had high dust exposure. You heard about, so, uh, somebody asked about um, or you heard about protective, uh, private, I think it's personal protective equipment. And 
Uh, Dr. D had said some of them may have used it, some of them not, but it didn't stop them from getting, you know, even with the protective equipment, they got enormous levels of dust exposure because they were getting these dust diseases, pneumoconosis and talcosis, but they weren't getting mesothelioma. And I think Dr. D was asked, well, and maybe Dr. Tess, well, why didn't JJ, or why didn't you do a study on consumer um, talcum powder exposure in addition to the minor and millers? And they both looked at it, the plants are like, it's sort of like if you wanted to test an umbrella and you're standing out in a hurricane and a pouring rain and it's wind and your umbrella works fine. I don't think you need to walk around in a light sprinkle in the spring to see if your umbrella works. It stood a hurricane. They did a study of the heavy, heavy exposure people. What Dr. Moline said in a prior case was the best evidence, right? The millers and miners, the best evidence to see if a substance causes a disease. Makes sense. Look at the people with the highest exposure. Miners and millers got pneumoconosis and talcosis, but they didn't get mesothelioma. Thousands followed over 70 years, massive talc exposure, zero cases of mesothelioma. They talked about a random Vermont talc man that wasn't in the peer-reviewed literature at some conference. That was the government study. The government decided that that person did not work in the mill and mines and wasn't included. And there's no evidence he even worked at the Vermont mines, there was the Vermont j and mine. There's no evidence about his other exposures, and there's no evidence it would have increased the results of the study had they included them. The same for the Italian. Remember the next of kin reported the guy in the mine, but even that report said even if we had included it, it wouldn't have changed the results. There was no increased risk of mesone. And the IR, best evidence, scientific, independent, trying to tell people what is a carcinogen and what is not, they concluded that talc without asbestos, and what did they call talc without asbestos? The mines that J&J &J used were the basis for this study, for the World Health Organization study. So when you get back there and you deliberate, you say, well, the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, they looked at the same epidemiology that's being discussed in this case. They looked at the epidemiology on the J&J &J mines, Vermont and Italy, and they concluded not classifiable as a carcinogen. Miners and millers were the best evidence. I mean, that's what you do when you don't have evidence. You criticize, you critique. You know, no study is perfect, but they have no evidence. So they criticize and critique the minor and miller studies, but the independent expert says it's the best source of evidence. Dr. Moline said it was the best source of evidence before she started being an expert against J&J. &J. She said, yeah, look at the millers and miners, because it is. It makes sense, right? Look at the people with the highest exposure. And they said the mines were J&J &J used in Vermont and Tau, no, uh, Vermont and Italy, no evidence that it was a carcinogen. And they called them asbestos-free mines for a reason. No evidence of cancer. They looked at the studies of J&J &J mine and concluded that they were asbestos-free and not a carcinogen. So the independent experts, the FDA has concluded no health hazard. Princeton, Harvard, Dartmouth, MIT, and others, no asbestos in baby powder. None of plaintiff's treating doctors has included J&J talcum powder cause for cancer. They're going to stand up here and say, oh, J&J didn't bring you a testing expert. We didn't hire somebody like Dr. Longo to come in and say, you know, he says asbestos, I say there's not. And you know what? I think you've heard enough about uh, from money, uh, from paid, hired experts for lawsuits. I could have, they talked about Dr. Sanchez, our expert. I could have brought him in here. Uh, to testify, but I'd rather stand with the FDA. I'd rather stand with NIOSH. I'd rather stand with OSHA. I'd rather stand with the World Health Organization and IARC and Dartmouth and Princeton and Harvard and MIT, people that have institutions, scientists that have no interest in this lawsuit, who have concluded again and again that there's no asbestos in baby powder, that there's no asbestos in shower to shower, and that the product is safe and that the science does not support what they're saying. I could have brought you another testing expert too, but you know what? I'm going to stand with the independent experts here. They don't have an interest in this lawsuit. They haven't brought you a single study, not even one, in any scientific journal ever concluding that Johnson's baby powder causes mesothelioma. No medical association. Think about all the medical associations trying to protect the public. The American Cancer Society, the American uh, uh, occupational Health Society, all kinds of, not one has ever concluded that's even a risk factor for cancer, mesothelioma. 
no government agency has ever concluded that talcum powder causes mesothelioma. Notwithstanding the press and the allegations in the lawsuit. Can I have um, I'll Okay. Now, I'll get you guys out of here real quick. I know I've kept you too long for lunch. I apologize. The, um, you guys, um, hopefully, will be good enough. You're going to get a verdict, maybe? You don't have it yet? No. You're going to get a verdict sheet from the court, and hopefully you'll be good enough to fill it out for us, and I'm going to take you through it um, on the outline. And this is what it looks like. And we just go through Mr. Barnes because the other ones are all essentially the same. And these are the questions hopefully you'll be good enough to answer for us. And the first one talks about how plaintiffs Douglas and Rosalind Barden proven by preponderance of the evidence that Douglas Barden was exposed to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top And so and you can answer yes or no. And there's two companies. Well, the first, J&J made the product till 79, and J&J Consumer Inc. after 79. But the first question, and I'm not going to fill it, I'm not going to presume to fill this out for you because you guys are a very sophisticated, intelligent jury based on your questions and your attention. But I'm going to suggest to you what the evidence uh, supports or not and leave it to you to, to, to fill it out. So, so the first question, if you answer no, everybody goes home. We don't go any further. And I suggest to you on this, the plaintiffs haven't come close to meeting their burden of proof. Was Mr. Barden exposed to asbestos? from any J&J &J product. Well, first, they haven't brought you any product that Mr. Barden actually used. There's no evidence of any testing on that. There's no exposure analysis that Dr. Longo did based on Mr. Barden's exposure. If, you know, if you assume there's asbestos in it, did he get enough beyond background? He didn't do that analysis. He's done it in other cases. It's their burden of proof. No container, no exposure analysis. Then, no biological markers. Complete absence of any evidence in the lungs, in the fibers, in the tissues. Why don't you ask a good question? I think they're going to punish me and say, well, there was no lung tissue to test, and you can't expect these plaintiffs to go through another surgery. Well, you can't. But then Dr. Atanus told you, you can test peritoneal. You can, they've all had surgery to remove tumors from their, from their abdomen, unfortunately. And there's peritoneal tissue. And you can look at it and see whether there's asbestos fibers in it. No evidence of any asbestos fibers in their peritoneal tissue. None. No scarring, no asbestosis, no pleural plaque, and they didn't bring you a single testing expert who actually tested the product. How do you meet your burden of proof? No bottle, no <laughs> testing expert who actually tested the product in the years that they used it. No evidence of any exposure in your lungs or your tissue. No evidence at all. Except allegations and innuendo and Dr. Longo saying, that's asbestos, that's asbestos, without even testing. So I submit to you, based on the evidence, the answer here should be no. And then the case is over. But if you disagree with me, and I submit the evidence doesn't support going beyond one. If you disagree, you get to the second question. Have plaintiffs Douglas and Rosalind Barden proven by a preponderance of, and the preponderance of the evidence means more credible evidence. It's, the test isn't who called the most witnesses and who put the most documents into evidence. The test is who, who brought the most believable. It's, it's quality, not quantity. Who brought the most believable uh, evidence? And for the second one, they are asking uh, whether there's an adequate warning or instruction. And you have to warn about a danger. The judge is going to give you a jury instruction on it. You've got to warn about a danger. And I submit to you, the FDA has considered at length this very issue, right? You saw the evidence. They actually had people analyze and test exposure analysis looking at this issue. And they concluded there's no failure to warn. There's no reason to warn. There's no failure to warn. The independent uh, testing agency looked and said, even if there's right, even if they're right, they assume up to 30,000 times more asbestos than Dr. Longo claimed to have found in J&J &J baby powder. Even if they're right, the FDA concludes it's not more than background air. It's not going to cause mesothelioma. The FDA has concluded there's no health hazard. I submit to you, look for the people who have no interest in this lawsuit as you make your decisions. And so I submit to you that the answer to that question should be no. And then, if you get past that, 
there's a there's a question about whether any any uh, lack of warnings was a substantial factor in causing these. Oops, I'm sorry. Commute. And that's a medical causation question. That that's where you have to decide whether any any warning um, made a difference because J and J was the medical cause of. Mr. Bard or any of the others needs to fill in. And on that issue, again, the FDA has concluded that even if they're right and they're not, the exposure wasn't enough to cause mesothelioma, and they have no evidence of exposure in their lungs or tissue. And so I submit to you that, that the answer to that question should be no. And then the next question is, was there an effective design? The product was designed exactly as it was intended. It wasn't a product that blew up or exploded. It performed exactly as it was intended to. So I would submit to you that that answer should be no. There was no safer alternative design. The cornstarch is not safer because of the yeast infection and flammability issues. It's a choice. And baby powder is safe. And the next one, same thing. The substantial factor question is the same. Is it the medical cause? If I submit to you, they didn't bring you the exposure analysis to let you decide that. Dr. Longo didn't give you any data. He did it for other plaintiffs in other cases you heard, but he didn't do an analysis to see if these, the way these plaintiffs used the product gave them enough exposure to what he claims to be the level of asbestos to cause mesothelioma. So without that evidence, submit to you all these substantial factor questions have to be no. They don't have, they didn't bring it. They didn't bring that evidence. And then finally there's a question about whether um, our product was made in consistent with our design specification. Of course it was. We follow our quality assurance and quality control specifications and did the testing that was required so to get there that question should be no. And just to wrap up um, Plaintiffs are lucky. The way this works, they get the last word. Plaintiffs are uh, I won't be able to stand up and, and uh, address anything they said, but you've heard it. You've heard it all, and you have your. You know, you've heard a lot of information, a lot of science. You guys have been great. You know, bearing with us and sticking out this very long trial in a freezing form. And um, as the plaintiffs' lawyers are talking, hold their allegations and what they're saying up to the light of their common sense. If it's true that baby powder and shower shower cause their pure peritoneal mesothelioma, why is it that they don't have a shred of evidence of any? If Dr. Wolf was right and they were exposed to millions and billions of fibers of asbestos, why is there no evidence, not a trace in their lungs or their tissue? No biological evidence of any scar. Lungs are clean. You saw so unheard about all four plants. Why is it that none of their treating doctors here. I and mean, treating doctors help their patients all the time, right? We know from experience that treating doctors try to help their patients when they can. And why aren't they here either by video or live to tell you, yes, I concluded that talcum powder was the cause. Now, what's the chances of having four sets of different plaintiffs, none with any biological markers of asbestos exposure, and none with any four different sets of treating doctors, and not one of them coming here and saying, yes, I agree with the plaintiffs, the baby powder or shower or shower was the doctors that you heard, doctors know about this. It's been all over the news. It's not a secret. They're not asking. Dr. Diaz, he said, I'm not asking people about cosmetic death. There's no scientific support for that. There's nothing about that in the medical records because there's no evidence and no science to support it. Ask yourself, why do all the government agencies, FDA, NIOSH, OSHA, disagree with their case? Why is it that all of these Harvard, MIT, Dartmouth, independent testing, would they put their considerable reputations on the line to be part of this, what, they, what has to be, if their allegations are true, some big conspiracy to hide from the world like everybody was in on it? MIT, OSHA, FDA, Dartmouth? Or is the truth that there's a difference between science and facts and evidence in the real world and lawsuit stories and lawsuit fiction? When you bring a lawsuit, you need evidence. Ask yourself where that is here. It's hard. I mean, it's hard. They're, they're going to talk this, this afternoon about this, the, the very real suffering of plants. And it's heartbreaking. And it's terrible. 
but you folks are here because you said you could do the hard job and give even a big company a fair shake. The plaintiffs didn't prove their case. And I submit to you on the evidence the plaintiffs have in front of us. If you weren't a big company and these weren't such sympathetic plaintiffs, we wouldn't even be here. Your Honor, I object. That comment is stricken from the record. They have no evidence of any exposure to asbestos. They have no containers that could be tested to show asbestos. They have the burden of proof. They brought three testing experts. Not one of them tested the product. Why? No science, not one study saying J&J's product causes mesothelioma. Nothing. Where's the evidence? Your common sense will get you to the truth. And I apologize for going wrong, and I apologize if I did anything to annoy you. In this case, I certainly annoyed the judge and the plaintiffs' lawyers, but don't take it out on J&J. You folks have been great. That comment is stricken from the record. Counsel, I'll see you at sidebar. Are you concluded? Yes, I was. Thank you. I thank you for your service, and good luck in life and your deliberations. I wish you the best. Ah, one last thing. When you get back there to deliberate, sometimes people don't agree, right? And you're supposed to try to reach a consensus, but you don't have to. If you don't agree that the plaintiffs have proven their case, if you don't agree that plaintiffs have the evidence to prove their case, stand your ground. Hold firm. Stand up for justice. Don't just say, oh, let's give the plaintiffs a little bit of money and get out of here. Stand up for justice, because the truth is they haven't come close. Don't agree if you don't believe they've proven their case. Stand up for justice, because even big companies should get a fair shake if the plaintiffs don't bring the evidence. Thank you for your service. I appreciate your patience. Members of the jury, it's now time for lunch break. Thank you. Remember, it's not time yet to deliberate. No discussions with regard to this case, including amongst yourselves, and no research of any kind whatsoever. Please be ready to come back upstairs at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what were we broadcasting to the jury there, that you've annoyed the judge and you've annoyed plaintiff's counsel? Well, they objected to me. You yelled at me a lot, so I want to apologize. I did not yell. I struck inappropriate comments from the record. I apologize to the jurors for that. That's what I was doing. I didn't hold it against my client. You were currying favor with the jurors that the judge was somehow rather impartial towards you and that you annoyed plaintiff's attorneys. Is there anything at this time? I would like to do it while it's fresh in my mind, list my objections to the closing. Since Mr. Panettiere is the first to go, I think he should go first with his objections, and I'll fill in. Or do you want me to just go? You go ahead. You have a lot more than I do, so if you cover it. Let's just get to it, okay? Okay. Go ahead. Should we do it now or in open court? I'm happy to do it. We can do it in open court. You know what? The jurors aren't here. Let's go back to our... You may be seated if you are remaining. Thank you. Mr. Glass, tell us. Yes, Your Honor. I have a number of objections to the closing. I tried to write things down as they went. I'm not certain I got everything exact. We can check the transcript later on. I don't list these in any order of importance, but just chronologically how they happened. As I recall, in the beginning of the case, there was an order about talking about people from J&J versus the company, and that order, again, was violated in the closing, where they were talking about people from J&J and dropping off their children, et cetera, and so on. They said that we accused them of being monsters and killers. 
Um, she said the lawyers acted like children. Well, that may be how she characterized her own self, but I don't think any of the plaintiff's lawyers acted like children. We acted like responsible people trying to represent our clients. They talked about lawyers, and if you recall, there were numerous motions in the beginning of this about how people were supposed to comport themselves. I wrote down things like lawyers for money, money trained for plaintiff's lawyers, scaring juries into believing it's true. This is about plaintiff's lawyers for money. These, as I hear, says, these plaintiff's lawyers paid her millions too. Well, she has no idea what my financial arrangements were with Dr. Molina, how many times that I had her on the stand, or how many, time, how many cases that she's been in with me. Plaintiff's lawyers filed lawsuits months before rubber stamping. I, I seem to recollect, and I can go back and check, but I'll just put on a record while it's fresh in my mind, that there was a whole motion about that, and the timing of um, expert reports versus when things would be filed, but yet again, um, there, um, it's in the record. Um, I lost my hearing for a second. Oh, um, there was something else here. Uh, numerous, I, I don't even know where to start about right after the instruction by the court concerning Ms. McNeil and biomarkers, counsel stood up and talked about biomarkers in the tissue, and, and she knows darn well that she doesn't have an expert to support that in Ms. McNeil's case. She knows that, right? She, they said um, they had babies themselves talking about the executives or the people at Johnson & Johnson. Again, violating the spirit of, of the court's prior order. And then, at one point, defense counsel pointed, I thought she was pointing directly at me, and said they paid Longo $30 million. Well, she doesn't know what I paid Dr. Longo. I certainly didn't pay him $30 million. And trying to group everything he got and make it like these three lawyers did all that, and that was the implication, totally improper. A story made up by the plaintiff's lawyers, I don't know if I got that one right, um, deliberately going afoul of the court ruling on the FDA immediately after, immediately after the court told counsel not to do it, immediately after. I saw something about lawyer props Lawyer shows are not evidence. Lawyer created evidence. You know, saying to a jury in an open forum, on a camera, that the lawyers created evidence, essentially accusing us of, of uh, violations of the RPCs, and that at least it could be interpreted that way, that's a pretty serious issue. Um, Using, I wrote down here, using sympathetic plaintiffs against big companies. I don't know if I got that exactly right. I guess the, the uh, but that's how I wrote it down as I was going. Um, I think it was repeated later on, and maybe my notes are better. Um, then we had a sidebar where the court had a discussion with counsel. And then the following happened, from my notes, after the sidebar. Plaintiff's lawyer trying to mislead you. The court calls a sidebar and counsel turns to the jury and makes a face when the court calls a sidebar. Then I'm pretty sure that counsel actually talked to the jury. Uh, I have to go back and check the record. Uh, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But about questions that the jury asked that weren't allowed to be asked to the witness. And I'll have to double check that, but I'm just going through my notes. Um, 
Then they talk, there's something about Dr. Blount not permitting anybody else to test her samples. I have no recollection that there's anything in the evidence about that. There is a wrong. I thought there was a ruling early on in the courts and at the record will stand for what it, it is about lost scares that went on, but I heard the, the notion about scares multiple times. Um, and then that we showed the commercials, not for evidentiary purposes, but just to make them look bad. And oh, by the way, just like following a mosquito truck. It's not. And there's no evidence for that. Um, I wrote down at 11.33, again, choosing to mislead you. Um, and then this bit about they can pay money in lawsuits, but we will not pay. Um, implying that there is something wrong with people exercising their constitutional right to bring a case. And by the way, I don't even think that is true. When they said, and we'll, we'll ask counsel if it is true, about what they said that they refused to ever pay. Um, we had a lot of nerve raising the Miller affidavit when we also called Dr. Longo, one had nothing to do with the other. And it was Dr. Hopkins, if you recall, that first admitted that the affidavit was perjurous until he came back the next time and counsel got on the stand and he took it back. That had nothing to do with Dr. Longo. Um, then the thing about the Krasinski case, an answer to interrogatory um, on Tremolite. And I believe they said that they meant to say Tremolite asbestos. I don't recall that being in the record. I don't recall Dr. Hopkins saying that he did. I'm wrong, but I don't recall it. And then they say, well, they just met up, met, messed up. They made a mistake. You can't say things in closing arguments that you don't have evidence for. And if there is, fine. If there's not, we'll go back through the record. But I'm just going through my notes. Plaintiffs are trying to confuse you, I wrote down. Um, lawyer tr uh, lawsuit tricks. I don't know what that was about, but I don't think that was proper. Folks here are not that naive. I don't believe that's proper. Um, I don't believe taking a picture from one study and putting it against another picture when you're not the expert and asking juries to draw conclusions about what's asbestos and what's not when there was no expert. If she would have said, here, remember what Dr. Uh, Weber said? I showed him this, I showed him this, and this is his testimony. But for counsel to say, hey, Look at this from the geological survey. Look at this picture. Do they match? That is not fair inference for a closing argument. Are there fibers in the tissue? Then there was a statement about, well, we all have family members with cancer, trying to somehow nullify. I mean, that's not proper. Uh, if I did that, Now, after the court, and I'd like to see the slide, but after the court made a specific instruction about tissue biomarkers for Ms. McNeil, specific instruction, there was a slide up there with Ms. McNeil's picture, and it said something about tissue biomarkers. I couldn't see it. It came down too fast. I couldn't see it to write it down fast, but I'm pretty sure it was there. And it had her picture. And it said tissue biomarkers. I'd like to see that particular slide at some point. Yes, sir. Um, I can address that briefly. It was Dr. Wilfred and Dr. Moline's testimony about Ms. McNeil that she had no biomarkers. 
Dr. Moline, that was about that was about X-ray evidence. Right. Ms. Dr. Moline was asked about. Uh, I think she was actually asked about um, tissue, and she said, oh, "I don't know anything about that." Um, as far as I know, there was no tissue to look at. I think that was something like her testimony. But we'll have to go back and look at it. She said was at page 291 of the unofficial transcript, based upon the question. And we know that all of our plaintiffs have had radiological CAT scan and other x-rays and examinations of whether there are things in their lungs consistent with asbestos exposure, right? And your answer was, they've had radiology. They haven't had, to the best of my knowledge, their lungs evaluated. And your honor, looking at sites, there's no evidence. But we're just proper, no evidence uh -huh. of exposure in lungs or tissue. They haven't produced any of that evidence. That's fair. That's not fair. Because they have no expert to support that proposition. And, and, and Dr. Moline, I thought, said, I don't know anything about the tissue issues. As far as I know, there was no tissue to look at. I thought that's what she said. I think that's what I just read. Okay. And then... Um, Counsel, you can be seated. Continue. Peritoneal tissue, you can test it. No biomarkers. Well, you know, when this case was postured for trial, Dr. Atmos's report said nothing about biomarkers, said nothing about looking at tissues. I had an expert pathologist. Okay. He died. I didn't get another one because these issues were never an issue. Or I would have gotten a doctor to come in here and explain that what was available wasn't enough or didn't matter. But for her to just stand up here and make those statements is way beyond the bounds. And to cite to Dr. Atmos when he had nothing in his report about biomarkers or who's analyzing the tissue for biomarkers is way beyond the pale. And I, I will incorporate that into my motion um, uh, on directed verdict when all the closings are done. Um, I thought there was a ruling early on about treating doctors and what you could say about the presence of treating doctors and there was. And I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at it, so I'm just making a record. But I don't know if it runs afoul of that ruling, but there were statements here about why the treating doctors are here. Um, my, my thought process was that that was ruled out, but I would have to double check the record. I thought that was what the prior court ruling was. And then the statement that we are not a big company uh, and and sick people, if it were if it weren't for the fact that we were a big company and sick people and there were sick people, we wouldn't even be here. I think I heard something like that. I, I don't know if I got it down or, um, perfectly, but I thought that's what I heard toward the end. And then the notion, finally, of pitting counsel against the court and saying, well, I annoyed the judge because the judge at certain times in the case um, had to rein counsel in, and I'm, I'm saying that politely, um, but to then, before a jury, pit the court against counsel. I don't know what that was about. I, I, I'm still thinking that one through. But uh, I don't know who, if other plaintiffs' counsel have issues. I did them while they were fresh in my mind. Um, I'm sure I missed some. I'm sure as soon as I walk out here, somebody will tell me I missed something. Uh, I don't know I got it 100% correct. So if anything I say is not reflected in the record, I apologize. But this is what I wrote while things were going. And because I didn't want time to pass and have my recollection fade anymore, this is this is what I wrote down. Thank you. Mr. Mata, do you wish to address the court at this time? The only thing that I'd like to say, Your Honor, is that on behalf of my clients, I'd like to uh, have a chance to read the transcript, to reflect upon it, 
to actually see the slides that we used in closing arguments, and I'd ask that the court compel counsel for J&J &J to produce the, the printed out slides to us so we could actually look at them and reserve our, uh, our rights to move for a mistrial based on the outrageous conduct of the closing. Thank you. Do you wish to be heard? And all I would add is that we would, we'd reserve the right to move for costs should a mistrial be granted if we if we do seek a mistrial, um, and I'd like to consult the transcript of the slides as well. Thank you. Do you wish to be heard at this time? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to respond in writing. Instructions. The court is considering striking your entire closing statement when we return. Well, Your Honor, I think that would be draconian and unfair, and I can take the order then, Your Honor. Um, first, on the uh, biomarker issue, it, it is proper. They are the plaintiffs. They have the burden of proof. It is proper to say they have no evidence, and that's fair. I mean, it happens all the time. They have no evidence uh, of exposure in long-term tissue. They could have brought an expert, and they chose not to. That's fair. Uh, on the issue of Dr. Tanis, Your Honor per permitted the jury question about generally, can you test peritoneal uh, tumors for fibers? And I was referencing that testimony. That was in evidence. The, the court permitted that. Here's what the court had a problem with. What could have been a, a good closing statement commenting upon the evidence was, unfortunately, replete with conduct that this court has already warned you about, that this court issued a ruling before opening statements, had to then issue an instruction to the jury after opening statements because you violated the court's ruling, and throughout the course of this trial, for which there is a pending motion to hold you in contempt. And at sidebar, after the first break, when you started off already commenting upon lawyer-driven litigation, lawyer-created litigation, lawyers showing shows and props, and when you don't have evidence, sometimes you have to create it, referring to the lawyers, um, that was replete throughout your entire closing statement, with other examples that is added by Mr. Placitello, and there are more. And so that is the basis for the court considering striking the entirety of your um, closing statement because those kinds of comments were so replete that to leave in only those appropriate comments on the evidence would be impossible. So I'll see you all at 2 o'clock. Thank you.